So by this point, if you have gone through all of the previous lessons and you have gone through and done all of the assignments, then you should have a pretty good idea already about what your product will look like. And uh, basically, we are already ready to start and hire our first designer and our first engineer. But before we do that, I wanted to take a little detour and go through a couple of different things that are extremely important to keep in mind as you start developing your product. And the first detour that I would like to make is to talk about patents and how we protect our idea legally so that it does not get stolen. And as you know, I'm an engineer and I'm a designer, but I'm definitely no lawyer. So for that reason, today I have invited a real IP lawyer to come and talk with us and discuss the most common questions when it comes to patents and provisional patent applications. So let's just jump into this talk and learn how we protect our ideas legally. Tony, uh, I would like to introduce myself to the rest of the audience. My name is Manisha Rav, and uh, I'm a practicing patent uh, attorney and advisor. I have been practicing uh, since a decade, uh, almost around 11 years. And what we do is we are running a law firm, which is an intellectual property law firm. And precisely, uh, we patent trademarks and copyrights. We deal with all kinds of intellectual property works. and that is pretty much it. Uh, we deal with the global clientele. We help inventors uh, formalize, uh, legalize their inventions across the globe. We help inventors uh, formulate brand strategies, IP uh, right strategies, so that they can align your IP strategies with, with the business that they are pursuing. Perfect. So you're the person to talk to when it comes to patents and uh, provisional patent applications then. So let's just delve into the questions here and answer those. Uh, so these questions, they are basically a list of things that uh, people oftentimes wonder about patents and uh, provisional patent applications. So uh, I'm going to be asking them, uh, taking on the role of the kind of unaware inventor who has a cool idea, but then does not exactly know how to work with patents around that idea. So uh, let's just delve into the first question here. Uh, the first question is, what different types of patents are there? Okay, Tony, let me um, give you an overview of the kind of patents. So patents um, could be divided into uh, various types. If you try to uh, have IP rights gained over a particular aesthetics or ornamentation of an object, you can apply for a design patent. In case your product uh, is exhibiting utilitarian uh, features it confers some kind of utility some kind of functional aspect you can go ahead with uh, a utility patent application so broadly yes design patent applications are there as well as utility patent applications are there if you try to protect the ornamental aspect of a product go for the design patents mm -hmm. if you're trying to gain rights over ip uh, in terms of functionality of a product go for the utility patent Got it, got it. So design patent for looks and utility patent for uh, functionality. Um, one more question on this. Are these t two types of patents worldwide available or do these patent types depend on which country you reside in? No, these patents are precisely very much uh, globally available. If you want to go, uh, you know, let's take example of US or European territory. Yes, you can go for a design as well as a utility pattern. So it, it is pretty much global. It's not specific to any country. All right. Got it. Awesome. Uh, then the second question I have is uh, what are the requirements for patenting uh, for these two different patent types? 24 design patterns, what we require is uh, various views of the designs, for example, the front, the top, the bottom plan, etc. All, you know, how the product looks from various angles, from various views. We need the sketches of all those patterns, all those uh, descriptions of the figures. And as far as the utility pattern goes, a lot goes into drafting a utility pattern application. So um, in general, uh, we require complete disclosure of technical background of the invention. This is for utility patterns only. And um, could you d uh, describe a bit more what complete disclosure uh, would mean? 
Okay, for example, if you're trying to uh, gain a patent over the looks and aesthetics of uh, a product like uh, a fancy umbrella, so if you're trying to file a design applications, we might be requiring different views of the product. And if you're trying to gain control over the utility rights, we would require you to submit disclosures like how the product works, how the umbrella opens, or you know what, what are the features, what are the new um, utilitarian features your umbrella has to offer. So the technical background will be uh, described in the utility patent. And when you're trying to gain control over the designs, we just require the looks, you know, mm -hmm. how a product looks from various angles that constitute the disclosure of a design pattern. Got it. So for a utility patent, we describe both the looks and also how it functions in greater detail. But for a design patent, we only need to describe the look of it. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Awesome. Uh, and would you say that it's easier to get a design patent than a utility patent in that case? Fairly easier as compared to the utility pattern. Design patents are fairly easier to gain. Okay, got it. Uh, then this brings us to the next question nicely, uh, which is uh, what rights do the different patent types provide? So what type of protection does a design patent and what type of protection does a utility patent provide? Tony, as the name suggests, uh, design patents confers uh, IP rights over the overall design, look and aesthetics of the product. How a product look will be decided by a design patent. If your product exhibit technical features, if it is conferring a certain utility, a functionality, mm -hmm. that will be covered by the utility patterns. So pretty much the name suggests the same. Design patterns for designs, utility patterns for utility. Got it. Uh, would you say that one of those is more easy or difficult to enforce than the other? Design patterns, sometimes uh, people can design around the design patterns. Uh, they are easy to overcome because you can tweak the features here and there and try to come up with your own design and ornamentation. Um, on the contrary, utility patterns are very strict patterns and they have certain standards of technical uh, information. So in my viewpoint, design patterns are fairly easier to overcome. Sometimes you can design around uh, an ornamentation or a look of a product. But yes, utility patterns are very difficult to uh, uh, trespass. And uh, how long does a patent protection last? Uh, it may last for a period of 20 years, depending on different countries, you know, where you decide to exercise your rights. On an average, it's 20 years from the date of filing of the first application. You mentioned uh, where you decide to make the patent. Um, I assume that most people, if possible, would like to have it uh, be protected worldwide. Uh, so is there something like a worldwide patent or do you always have to file in each country where you would like to protect it? Okay, this is a very interesting uh, question. Uh, patents, there is nothing like a worldwide patent. Okay. Having said that, there is a protocol which is Patent Cooperation Treaty, PCT. Uh, that's a protocol. If your country is a convention and contracting party to the PCT protocols, you can easily file one application and then follow-up applications will be filed at the national stages of those countries. But if you ask me, is there any international patent? No. Patent rights are territorial. So if you want to give your, gain your protection in the United States, you need to apply at the United States specifically. Uh, in Europe, you need to apply uh, at the European Patent Office. So these patent rights are territorial. If you want to uh, make uh, less burden, if you want to exercise uh, easier options, then you can file uh, one application through Centralized Patent Cooperation Treaty, which is PCT. But having said that, patent rights are still territorial in nature. You need to apply for each and every specific country. Nothing like international patent. And is there any reason for why one would not go directly to applying to the PCT? So is there any reason to apply for a, a country regional patent? You select PCT option only when you need to apply for more countries. If you're invention, if you're looking at protecting your rights in more than, you know, probably seven to eight countries or more than 10 countries, right? It is better and it is easier to file through a centralized system, which is PCT. But if you're looking to patent your invention, say in two countries or three countries, a better option is to file individually in those countries. 
Got it. Uh, and now the question that I think very uh, many people are interested to know, it is uh, what is the typical cost of a uh, patent? And I understand that it will vary quite a lot depending on the invention, but if we take a quite simple device like a phone holder or something that is not too mechanically complex, uh, what would your approximation uh, be in those cases? Okay, Tony, by, by the fee, you mean the professional fee or the government fee? Uh, that is a good question. Uh, if you can um, talk about both fees, that would be great. Okay, Tony, uh, if, uh, let's say government fee, uh, so fee varies um, as per the country. For example, in US, if you try to gain a patent over uh, a utility invention, and if you're a small entity, you end up paying around 450 US dollar or more. And if you're a large entity, the you know, fee basically doubles up. So it is very much dependent on the country where you're applying. So it is very difficult to give you an estimate of each and every country. So I picked up US and tried to give you an example of that. Uh, for example, if you try to file a provisional patent application in the US and you're a micro entity, a student, a solo inventor, the fee, which is a discounted fee, precisely discounted government fee is just 70 US dollar. So you can file your application just, you know, um, at the cost of uh, 70 USD, which is $70, and uh, try to gain, um, you know, uh, control over the priority date. So that is uh, pretty much about the US territory. Uh, 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 one, one second, just to clarify. Uh, so a US utility full patent would be 450 uh, Did I hear you right? The government fee. Yes, it's around 475 Yes, it's 450 to 475 okay. the fee rating. Yes. Okay, um, and uh, okay, before we jump into something very interesting that you just mentioned, the provisional patent application, uh, could you also talk about the lawyer fees in the uh, US again as an example? Because many of my students will reside in the US, in Australia, uh, Singapore, so quite um, expensive countries. Yes, um, this, this is an expensive process. Uh, let me clarify this a little bit it depends your attorney for example you're deciding to file a basic provisional application for a very basic device so your uh, professional fee of a lawyer could range from uh, thousand usd to about 1500 to 2000 us dollars that's that's pretty much uh, the drafting fee which is applicable for very basic inventions so if you try to uh, patent something very complex, it can range from 2,000 to 5,000 US dollar uh, per application, per draft. Mm -hmm, got it. So then for a regular uh, utility patent, we are looking at 450 just the in US, just the application fee. Then the lawyer fees yep. between 1,000 and uh, 2,000 for the uh, quite simple invention. And then 2,000 to 5,000 for more complex inventions. Yes, more complex or non-provisional inventions. So the lawyer fees varies. I have just given you an estimate. I would like to draw your attention on the fact that when you file a patent application in the U.S., there are different um, entities. For example, if you're a micro entity with a certain threshold of annual income, the government, USPTO, gives you discount uh, in the filing fee. So this applies to micro entity. And if you're a small entity, there is a certain threshold of annual income. If you qualify that, you file for micro entity. Yes, if you're a big corporate house, you fall in the large entity section and there is no discount applicable in that case. So when you decide to file, for example, say in US, try to find out the fee and try to find out which category you fit in. For example, if you're a micro entity, your fee will definitely be reduced. And um, the one example that I've provided you, the 450 US mm -hmm. dollar thing, mm -hmm. for this non-provisional application fee for a micro entity, 450 to 470 US dollar, non-provisional for micro entity. Got it. So uh, 450 is for a micro entity, and if it would be a large company, it would be more than that. Uh, this is a very good uh, thing. Uh, if people want to find out more about these... Uh, government help schemes in US, uh, what would they search for on Google? They're very, it's very easy. You can approach uh, the USPTO uh, portal, which is USPTO.gov, and you can find uh, ample of information uh, regarding the micro entity and the annual income threshold uh, for you know different years. It is very easily accessible. Just Google USPTO 
find the Google USPTO mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Landing page. You can have every information readily available there. <clears throat> All right, USPTO dot uh, gov or just Google G- USPTO. Uh, nice, awesome, and. Uh, Now moving on to something that you quickly mentioned, uh, which is a very interesting thing for my audience, because I think many, many people who are taking my course will be in a situation where they are quite early and they are not sure that they want to invest a lot of money into a patent before they know that they can actually capitalize on their invention and that there is a market demand for it. So you mentioned something called provisional patent application uh, earlier, uh, PPA. Uh, Could you just quickly describe what that is? Okay, Tony, so this applies to each and every country. Provisional applications, uh, provisional applications are very uh, basic applications where you provide the minimal available uh, details about your invention. So provisional applications are not applicable to design application. By provisional, I just mean the utility applications, applications where you're trying to claim certain utility technical aspect of a product. So provisional applications are very good to file when you have uncertainty about, you know, the kind of product you're going to launch to the market or how the product will fare when that is launched in the market. So it's it's an easier way and it's a cost effective way to gain priority date and earlier filing date um, to have some kind of monopoly um, into the scenario. So I would recommend a provisional application if you are a solo inventor, if you're not sure what you're going to do with your invention, but you have an idea that you would like to protect and you don't want uh, to spend a fortune you know, filing and paying the attorney fees. It's it's the best way to protect your invention, gain a priority date over it by the way of filing a provisional application. All right, so if I understand correctly, uh, to the regular patents, we have this alternative of PPAs and you can file a PPA using less information that you than you would need for a full patent. It will be less expensive and it will give you protection as well. Uh, what, what type of protection does a PPA offer compared to a regular patent? Provisional patent applications are not examined. So if you say it offers any protection, that's wrong. It doesn't offer any protection. Provisional okay. patent applications, when you file these applications, you gain a priority date. That means if you have filed your application on 10th of March, and if any other inventor files the application on a similar concept on 12th of March, your application will be given priority over his application. So by the way of filing a provisional application, what you're gain- gaining is a priority date. So anybody that comes later on, files for the similar uh, concept, will not be given preference over you. For example, uh, let's talk about the US scenario. It's always first to file. Those who file the application first will have priority over it. So when I say provisional applications, Mm -hmm. please remember the fact that within span of 12 months, you have to file final application, which is eventually examined by the US PTO, which is the US Patent and Trademark Office. So there is, if you try, if you intending to file a full application, you have to file a full application within 12 months of the filing date of the provisional application and then yes it becomes applicable for priority it becomes applicable for examination and search got it so the provisional patent application it will give priority to a potential upcoming uh, application for 12 months but within that span uh, i as the inventor need to decide whether i want to continue with this and actually apply for the full patent or whether I don't want to do that. So for example, if I have an invention and again, I'm testing market demand and I'm not ready to spend um, maybe 5,000 on a full patent, then I can apply for a provisional patent application. I will have 12 months to actually test the uh, the idea, test if people need it. And then if I decide that it is worth pursuing, worth investing in, then at the end of that period, I will apply for the full utility patent. Uh, is that uh, correct? Yes, within within the span of 12 months, that's correct. Uh, great, great. And uh, which countries allow for PPAs? Okay, I'll give you an example of, of uh, UK. 
UK doesn't have anything like provisional applications. You have to file an application which will be a full application. Take an example of Canada also. They don't have anything like a provisional application. When you file an application, it either has to be complete or incomplete. So there are you know, exceptions. There are countries where there is no formal protocols of filing a provisional application. Uh, now, let me take examples of India. Let me take examples of uh, U.S. These are the countries where you can file a provisional application as well as a non-provisional application, depending on the case. So you need to research which countries apply, which countries actually go for provisionals and which countries have uh, uh, written in their statutes that provisional applications are welcome. That is very important. Got it. Uh, many of my students will be from Australia, a US, like you mentioned, and then also Singapore, among many other countries, of course. But uh, could you just briefly say if you know uh, if PPAs are allowed in Australia and Singapore? Yes, we have filed for Australia, the provisional applications. Okay. And uh, for Singapore? And Singapore, uh, we generally don't file much applications for the Singapore region, but I think they should have some uh, provisional applications uh, available. But uh, having said that, you need to research whether still they allow the provisional applications to be filed or not. But yes, Australia does allow a provisional application filings. And then in which uh, regions are uh, PPAs able to provide protection? The regions where um, the provisional applications are filed. So you need to find out, uh, by the way, uh, you know, of which country you decide to file your application in. Try to access the details of the patent office of that respective country and see whether provisional applications are applicable there. I have already given you an example of India. I've given you an example of um, Australia. I've given you an example of uh, uh, US where provisional applications are formally accepted. And then which are the requirements for a PPA? Uh, you said you need to provide less information than for a full utility patent, uh, but what information would you need to provide? Basic information like how your product works, a couple of figures if you have you know, hand-drawn figures. Some of the patent offices do accept hand-drawn figures, otherwise the black and white line drawings would be accepted. Uh, basic information of uh, um, the product, what the product is intended to do, what what is the application of the product, what are a couple of technical features, uh, you know, that you could easily um, highlight in your applications would be required. Not much of intricate information because it is still uh, provisional, but at the same time, it should uh, disclose uh, what you're intending to do. This. There is one very important point which I would like to mention here. If you're filing for an umbrella, please don't change it into an apple <laughs> when, when you try to file your non-provisional. It's very important that, that you stick to the scope and uh, ambit of the technical disclosure that you have filed in the provisional, in your non-provisional as well. So whatever you're going to disclose in your provisional should match what you're going to or what you're intending to file in the non-provisional application. That, that's very much important at this point of time. Got it. Uh, before you uh, describe the lawyer fees for a full patent uh, for ranging between 1000 and 1500 for a simple invention and then somewhere between 2000 and 5000 for or even of course the sky is the limit I guess with the complexity of the application but uh, somewhere between that range uh, were those numbers for a US based lawyer or for somebody um, somebody abroad? I think predominantly U.S. The first ones were were in the context of the U.S. lawyers. Okay, and if we compare this again, the fee for the um, for the PPA in the U.S. context, context, just so that we compare apples to apples, you know, uh, uh, yes, yes. could you repeat what the fee would be there? See, based on our experience, I've seen people paying fifteen hundred to two thousand U.S. dollar for a basic application. If you're trying to approach a solo attorney who is not running a law firm or something of that sort, maybe you can, you know, like crack a deal within 1500 US dollar for one application draft. So it depends. It varies. And we're talking about the PPA now, right? Yes, the provisional applications. Okay, got it. Perfect. Um, awesome. So now we have discussed quite a lot about patents. We have discussed these uh, provisional patent applications, which one can do and uh, most likely should do as a solo inventor or as a small business. Um, but now I would like to just switch to more general um, talking about your experience with um, patent law. 
And uh, my first question here is, are there situations where it is preferable to go for a full patent before filing a PPA? Yes, that there are situations like that. There are many inventors uh, uh, who directly file non-provisionals. They don't follow the provisional route. And these inventors uh, are the ones who have a very clear idea about their product. They have complete work done accomplished over the technical aspects of the invention so they, they are not in the middle of anything they know what they want to do and in that case they go for the non-provisional applications got it so if you already know exactly what you what your invention is exactly um, how it's gonna sell in the market you know that there is a demand you know that it will be worth investing then you can just go straight ahead to the full patent before uh, because uh, the reasoning being that you're not wasting any time or money on the ppa is that correct yes that's that's absolutely correct beautiful uh, then the final thing here is uh, what is the number one mistake that you see small businesses or individuals uh, making around uh, patents and uh, IP law in general? Oh, there's a one big mistake that I see happening all over the place and that is trying to disclose your invention to third parties or making public disclosures without filing a mm. basic provision application or without even signing a basic IP disclosure NDA agreement. This is what I see and witness everywhere. Wow, okay. So the issue is that people talk about their idea, which makes it uh, public knowledge basically from the point of view of the patent office, which makes it invalid for a patent, right? Yes, public disclosures would not be entertained. Uh -huh. And um, this is avoided by either you already mentioned filing a PPA before you're talking about your idea uh, so that if the one that you're speaking with, if that company or uh, person decides to copy your idea and file for a patent or something like that, then, uh, then you already have the PPA pending. So you have the foot into the door like we talked about. Uh, or uh, if you don't have a PPA, you can um, you can sign N NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. Is that correct? Absolutely correct. All right. That's uh, absolutely. Is there any other way to avoid falling into this number one common trap that you can think of? Yes, be smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I guess that's just a good life advice in general. Uh, be be smart. <laughs> don't don't do stupid things that will cost you a lot. All right, nice. Uh, I actually don't have any more uh, questions prepared, but is there anything that you would like to mention that I have not asked uh, so far? Yes, there's one thing which I think we, we haven't discussed. Let me just uh, clarify that. Uh, there is a grace period of 12 months. So accidentally, if you have disclosed your invention, um, you know, say in a public gathering, or you have by mistaken published your application in some scientific journal. So the government gives you a 12 months grace period within which you have to file your application, either provisional or non-provisional. This was one thing that, I, you know, I think we did not talk about. That's interesting though. But this is more meant as a, as a tool to kind of compensate for blunders. Like you said, you're at some party and you start, start talking about it. So yeah. this, this could not be used the same way as a PPA because if, for example, if I put up a website and start promoting my product and showing exactly how it works, then is there a grace period that could be used for that disclosure? It will be tricky. Okay. I'm saying by disclosure, I mean public disclosure in front of a learned society. For example, showcasing your product in an exhibition before you know a couple of... Um, enthusiasts. That could be a public disclosure as well. Uh, publishing your product specifications in a scientific journal, that is public disclosure. But if you fully commercialize your invention out there in the public, that doesn't stand for, you know, um, uh, what you say, the grace period. Right. So this is more meant for uh, compensating for blunders and not actually as a yeah replacement for but PPAs or anything like that. That is very interesting. All right. Awesome. You know, thank you very much for your time here. Okay. Um, I have learned quite a lot of things and uh, I feel just more more calm actually talking to somebody who's a lawyer who has a lot of experience about these things because with law it is always tricky and uh, 
the devil is in the details and uh, your answering these questions has been extremely, extremely helpful. So thank you very much, uh, Manisha, for this talk. Thank you very much, Tony, for bringing uh, and helping out all those people out there uh, knowing more about intellectual property law. And it's been a pleasure talking to you and to your audience.